Thanks very much. Um, yeah, so I'm not going to talk about any modeling and simulation stuff today. I'll talk to a little bit about um, the results of our recent uh, study, which has garnered some attention in the press, about ultra-processed diets. And the title of the study in the paper and my talk today is Ultra-Processed Diets Cause Excess Calorie Intake and Weight Gain, an Inpatient Randomized Control Trial of Ad Libitum Food Intake. Um, you know, as a physicist by training, um, you know, I'm naturally a reductionist. And so when I started to kind of hear about these, you know, critiques of nutritional reductionism, something that's been called nutritionism, um, and this is a, a book uh, by one of the uh, proponents of these uh, critiques, uh, they say that nutritionism or, or nutritional reductionism is characterized by a reductive focus on the nutrient composition of foods as a means to understanding their healthfulness, as well as a uh, reductive interpretation of the role of these nutrients in bodily health. <laughs> Um, Michael Pollan later went on to say that the case of nutritionism is the widely shared but unexamined assumption that the key to understanding food is indeed the nutrient, and put another way, foods are essentially the sum of their nutrient parts. Um, I kind of like that idea, <laughs> of kind of from a reductionist scientific standpoint. I want to break something apart and figure out, you know, what the what the relative uh, importance of the various uh, subcomponents are. And, you know, we have focused for a long history on the nutrient composition of foods, and it's been quite productive. Um, so I kind of didn't quite understand the basis of this, this idea. And in fact, um, I'll talk a little bit of, of, about some of the proponents of a, of a food classification system that's meant to address diet quality, and they actually downplay the role of nutrients at all in human health, which I don't think I can share that conclusion. But the, the basic idea is that you can't, you know, take foods in their whole, you know, natural goodness and basically reproduce those same sorts of substances by matching the nutrient compounds in ready to eat or ready to heat products. Um, and so this idea that something that we do to foods in the process of creating them into convenient shelf stable relatively inexpensive, tasty things, which I, I'm pro all of those things, um, is, is somehow disrupting something about those foods and leading them to, to have uh, negative consequences on health. And so uh, the folks in Brazil, led by Carlos Monteiro, developed a system called the NOVA classification system. And what they basically do is try to make this contrast between sort of whole foods and meals prepared from whole foods and culinary ingredients with, in contrast with ultra-processed foods, so-called ultra-processed foods. And so the top row would be, um, you know, whole foods and meals produced from, from you know, combining those, those foods and culinary ingredients together. And the bottom row, I've highlighted this in the slide, are uh, products that are not variants of the foods in the meals above, they're formulated from industrial ingredients, contain little or no intact foods, and by their very nature are unhealthy, should be grouped together and avoided. It's a pretty extreme sort of <laughs> statement. Um, but it formed the basis of the dietary guidelines for Brazil. The golden rule underneath those guidelines was always prefer natural or minimally processed foods and freshly made dishes and meals to, uh, to ultra-processed foods. So this was the basis for those guidelines. So it went from a novel system about 10 years ago of classifying foods based on their, their extent and purpose of processing, ignoring most, for the most part their nutritional content, to a dietary guideline recommendation. And, you know, like I said, I had a sort of fundamental un unease about this process. There had never been a randomized controlled trial to investigate any aspect of ultra processed foods. And so that was basically the, the start of my interest in this area. And so we conducted recently at the NIH Clinical Center the first randomized controlled trial. Um, based on comparing foods that were either, or diets that were composed primarily of ultra-processed food products versus primarily um, whole foods and culinary ingredients com prepared into to diets. And what we were focused on, because my lab is primarily interested in obesity, is to ask the question of if you were to uh, provide people with exposure to these foods in a controlled setting, 
We had these people come in and stay with us for 28 days continuously, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, and exposed them to all of their food and measured every morsel of food that they ate over the entire 28-day period. And in random order, um, we assigned them to two weeks of the ultra-processed diet, uh, followed immediately by two weeks of the unprocessed diet, um, or vice versa. And the question that we were interested in was, uh, did these folks, when they were given very simple instructions, just eat as much or as little as they want, did they have any difference in calorie intake? That was the primary aim of this study. Um, and let me tell you a little bit more about how we design these diets, because I think it's kind of important. Um, so if you push the folks who promote this idea that avoiding ultra-processed foods is potentially a good idea and will help address the obesity epidemic, they'll, they'll say, well, yeah, it's, it's because those foods are, tend to be high in salt, sugar, and fat. And that strikes me as an odd explanation, given that I was just told that the nutrients aren't the important things. It's the, it's the, uh, the processing of the food. So we decided if we wanted to look at the effects of ultra-processed foods independently of these nutrients of concern, in particular salt, sugar, fat, and some people also say fiber content is, is another area. They tend to have, ultra-processed foods tend to have low fiber. Then what we should do is match the diets for some of these nutrients. So we'll give them the same number of calories that they could potentially consume. Um, they were uh, presented to people at double their total energy expenditure, so they could if eaten everything, they would have drastically overeaten. Um, the carbohydrate fat content was identical. The sodium content was, was uh, matched. The fiber content was matched in one case, obviously, by providing fiber supplements to these people on the ultra-processed diet. And the sugar content was matched. And so, um, again, these meals were designed to be matched in these various categories of nutrients of, of, of interest. But in one case, coming all from ultra-processed foods, and in the other case, coming primarily from unprocessed uh, or minimally processed foods. So like I said, these are the meals kind of side by side that were presented to these subjects. Um, and they had similar amounts of calories, carbs, fat, protein, sugar, sodium, and fiber. And 20 adults, 10 men, 10 women, from a, a wide range of BMIs, uh, going from 18 to 42. Uh, basically, we're asked to stay with us for 28 days. We give them three meals a day. They had unlimited access to snacks. And uh, basically, we said, eat as much or as little as desired. And we're just going to measure calorie intake differences. And we measure their body weight continuously throughout this, this process, but they were blinded to their weight. They had continuous glucose monitors on, but they didn't see what those values were. And they all wore scrubs that were loose fitting, so they couldn't get any sort of feedback about whether or not they're, they're increasing their body weight or decreasing their body weight by the tightness of their clothes. And so, um, you know, again, just to kind of put this to the test, if there was no difference uh, between these diets in terms of these nutrients that were thought to be driving the process of overeating and obesity, which has been linked to ultra-processed food consumption in the past, and you wouldn't expect any difference in energy intake. Whereas if there's something else, albeit unidentified, about the ultra-processed diet that causes a difference in calorie intake, then we might expect to see a difference. I kind of was on the former side. I didn't expect to see much of a difference, but I was wrong. Here's the day-to-day uh, energy intake, average energy intake of the folks, these same folks, again, in random order, exposed to the ultra-processed diet compared to the unprocessed diet. There was um, about an average of 508 calories a day different between these two diets. If you break it down in terms of carbohydrates, fats, and proteins, um, the difference was entirely in carbohydrate and fat. Protein intake was identical on average between the two diets. These folks consumed the same amount of sugar. They consumed the same amount of fiber on the two diets. So there was no difference in intake of sugar, fiber, or protein. They consumed more salt on the ultra-processed diet compared to the unprocessed diet, um, despite the meals being matched in their sodium intake or sodium presented. So they're allowed to choose which foods they eat. We just measure what's left over and figure out how much of each of these things they ate. Um, they ate more, uh, significantly more at breakfast and lunch. It trended for dinner, but there was no statistically significant difference. And the snack period was, there was no hint of a signal there at all. 
When we ask people uh, to report throughout the day their hunger, their fullness, their satisfaction, and eating capacity, we found no significant difference in these values. We also found no significant difference on how pleasant they rated the foods or how familiar the foods were. And this was partly by design. I mean, we tried to design these menus so that they were relatively palatable so we wouldn't have people dropping out of the study. And we wanted to include people in the study who weren't going to be completely unfamiliar with the types of foods that we were giving them and introduce some sort of neophobia or something like that. So this is, uh, you know, perhaps not as surprising as it might be otherwise. Um, but one of the interesting things that we found was that uh, when we were measuring how quickly, and this was covertly, they didn't know we were measuring how quickly they were eating their meals, they ate their ultra-processed meals much more quickly, whether or not you express this in terms of grams per minute or calories per minute. Um, so I think that that has some potentially interesting mechanistic ex um, uh, hypotheses that can be generated from that observation. In terms of uh, body weight, not surprisingly, uh, given the differences in calorie intake, uh, during the ultra-processed diet, people gained weight, and then these same people during the unprocessed diet lost weight. And this was also translated into changes in body fat mass as measured by DEXA. And at the end of the study, as these were the values that we reported. So they gained almost a kilo of body weight on the um, ultra-processed diet and lost about a kilo of body weight on the unprocessed diet. One of the things that is particularly striking is that there was a huge degree of inter-individual variability. So on average, there was a 508 calorie a day difference between these two diets, but there was one guy who was almost 1,700 calories a day eating more on the ultra-processed diet compared to the unprocessed diet, and others who ate more or less the same number of calories on both diets. And what you can see is that there's a very strong degree of correlation between the weight changes um, that, that we observed and the calorie intake differences that were observed on these diets, maybe not too surprisingly given that the laws of thermodynamics hold and there weren't substantial differences um, in, uh, in energy expenditure, although we did measure some differences. Um, so needless to say, I think that there's a lot of open questions here. You know, we can't predict ahead of time who's going to be most responsive to these diet differences. Um, on average, there seems to be a very large effect, at least in this initial cohort of people, that uh, needs to be reproduced. Um, and we don't know what the mechanisms are, right? It's probably not those nutrients that we talked about. Um, so, you know, we, we published this, uh, this study, um, the preliminary results of this in a preprint form in February, and I received more emails than anything else I've ever published. Um, uh, with people with varying degrees of certainty saying they know exactly what, what's causing this effect. It's like this Rorschach test. If you're in one sort of diet camp versus another, then you believe that something is, is responsible for what we're seeing. Um, and so but the, I think the fact of the matter is we just don't know. Um, the mechanisms uh, by which the uh, ultra-processed diet versus the unprocessed diet influenced calorie intake are at present unknown. What we might be able to rule out is it's probably not just the salt, the sugar, the fat, or the fiber, because those things were matched in these different groups. Um, and salt and uh, fiber, oh sorry, sugar and fiber intake, actual consumption was not different between the two groups. Yeah, so we presented them with the same and they ate the same. Um, it might not be palatability. That would be my first guess, right? People just liked the ultra-processed diet more, they ate more of it. Um, when you ask people to rate the pleasantness of tasting that first bite of each of those meals, they didn't rate it being different in pleasantness, which I think is interesting. It's kind of encouraging in some sense. It means that if you were to kind of switch and you might have been one of those responders uh, that, that had the big difference in calorie intake, that you might not just hate your diet if you switch to an unprocessed diet. Uh, you might still enjoy it perfectly well. Um, I thought that perhaps most intriguingly, one of the things that we noticed was that during the unprocessed diet, uh, hormone levels in the blood changed in such a way that would support decreased energy intake. Uh, so for example, PYYs, a hormone secreted by the gut that, um, that suppresses appetite, and that went up during the unprocessed diet. 
And um, in the opposite direction, the hunger hormone ghrelin went down during the unprocessed diet, suggesting that there might be some sort of interesting interaction between you know, the matrix at which the food is delivered to the gut, where in the gut it's being digested and absorbed, and subsequently which hormones are being secreted in response to those, uh, those nutrient uh, um, uh, digestion and absorption that supports differences in energy intake over time. The other important consideration was even though the meals that were presented to people were matched in terms of their total energy density, the non-beverage uh, component of that were actually quite different because one of the things that we had to do is to match the fiber content, we were adding a lot of soluble fiber to beverages, um, basically calorie-free beverages in the unprocessed diet. But beverages don't contribute to satiety in the same way that foods do. And so folks like Barbara Rolls and others have demonstrated over the years that high energy dense foods tend to support um, increased energy intake over time, although the previous studies are limited to two days of measurement at this point. And so at least if that's the mechanism by which this happens in our study, it at least persists over 14 days. There's also this interesting aspect of the eating rate, right? And uh, it's just a fact that the, uh, that the ultra-processed meals that we gave to people, the foods were you know, softer, easier to chew and swallow, and perhaps that leads to faster eating rate. And because it takes some time for the signals from the gut to reach the brain to tell you, you know, how much you've eaten, perhaps by the time your brain gets that signal and you've eaten these highly processed foods, it's too late. You've already overeaten, perhaps. At least that's one potential explanation. Another explanation is something called the protein leverage hypothesis. So even though we tried to match these diets pretty well for protein, I think in one diet they were you know, about two percentage points different. When I first designed the study, I thought, yep, yeah, it's matched in protein. It turns out they weren't quite matched in protein. It was about 2% lower on the ultra-processed diet. And there's these folks in Australia, uh, Stephen Simpson in particular, who have this idea that you eat for a total amount of protein, and if you dilute the protein content of the diet slightly, you will overeat calories to compensate for that and still reach your protein target. And as I showed you, the actual intake of protein on these two diets was identical. So that lends some support to the idea, at least in theory. Um, but even if you give every bit of uh, weight to the evidence for the protein leverage and assume that that process takes place entirely, um, that could only explain at most half of the effect size that we saw in this study. So there's potentially something else going on. Maybe we're also eating for a target amount of nutrient X, which was diluted in the ultra-processed diet. Um, I don't know what nutrient X might be, but um, perhaps we're overeating calories on, on uh, these uh, diluted uh, X nutrient uh, 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 diets in order to give rise to this increase in calorie intake. I don't think we know enough about that yet. And then finally, there's this idea that maybe something else that's in the ultra-processed diet that's not in the unprocessed diet, the artificial flavors, emulsifiers, other ingredients, or lack thereof might be driving the effect size. Again, it's a perfectly reasonable hypothesis, which we might need to pay some attention to. And then finally, a um, lot of attention about the role of the microbiome on this process. Um, I don't know that the microbiome could have explained the effect that we saw on the very first day of a transition between these two things, but um, you know, I can't rule it out entirely. Uh, there's a lot of potential uh, hypotheses underlying these differences. So some other key questions are, you know, can ultra-processed foods be reformulated to avoid their effects on calorie intake and weight gain? And I would say, yeah, maybe, but we need to know what the mechanism is first, right? It's hard to know the answer to that question. Um, but our studies suggest that, you know, maybe this focus on the salt, the sugar, or the fat content might not be the most effective. Right, I guess there are some countries like Chile who are you know, proposing you know, black warning labels on products uh, based on their salt, sugar, and fat content. And at least our study suggests that even if you match for those variables, you might still see a very substantial difference in energy intake. And one of the things that's kind of interesting is that I think that the proponents of the NOVA classification system think of it as a, uh, as a feature that you can't reformulate a product uh, that is currently in the ultra-processed category to move it out 
into an unprocessed category, right? That's, their focus is on processing. And even if you improve the nutrient profile of that food substantially, it would still be classified as an ultra-processed food according to the NOVA classification system. Um, I think they think that of that as a feature of their system, uh, whereas others might think of it as a flaw. I think that they think of it as a feature because they perceive members of the food industry trying to game the system in some sense by basically designing their products to meet whatever nutrient-specific guidelines there might be, whereas the products themselves might still be unhealthy. And the, the, the example that was pointed out to me recently is this idea of the walking taco, uh, which is, I guess, some sort of Dorito-like product that has uh, been propagating around uh, American classrooms, which meet the, the Healthy Hungry Free Kids Act guidelines, but is essentially what most people would consider junk food um, by looking at it, and yet it meets all the nutrient requirements. So I think the NOVA folks think that you know, their categorization system would avoid such practices, but I don't know. Because I think that the policy implications aren't really clear, even though there's been a lot of discussion about you know, this being the first sort of randomized controlled trial and that there's uh, the first sort of causal relationship being established here and there's a lot of epidemiological evidence linking these products to, uh, to various different uh, deleterious health consequences. These the products are convenient, they're tasty, they're inexpensive, they're safe from a micro microbiological perspective. Those are not, you know, those are good properties, right? Um, they also contribute a large fraction of habitual dietary calories and nutrients to the USA and elsewhere. So something like 60% of calories in the US are coming from ultra-processed foods. Now that might be scary to a lot of people, um, but it also, it's, it's an important point to recognize if you're going to think about then taxing as a category ultra-processed foods, which is something that's being discussed at the policy level, right? And the problem is, is that the people who are uh, most using those products happen to be at the lower socioeconomic end of the, of the spectrum. And so just taxing those foods without, you know, giving some sort of guidance and support to shift diets away from those, those kinds of things might be disastrous for those folks, given that right now preparing meals from unprocessed foods and culinary ingredients takes more time, money, skill, and equipment to do safely and effectively. And so, for example, in our diets, uh, it took us 40% more to construct the unprocessed meals compared to the ultra-processed meals. And so I think that's important to recognize. And so taxing those things would likely be regressive and disproportionately affect those at lower SES. So with that, I'd like to conclude and thank the folks who really did the work on this study. And uh, I think we have some time for questions.